In the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. In the article I wrote for last week's dialogue, I included a quote from a speech made by Theodore Roosevelt. Roosevelt was the 26th President of the United States. He gave the speech in Paris on April 23, 1910, the year following the end of his presidency. I will admit, I know very little about President Roosevelt, at least before I read this speech. I guess I knew what most people knew. I knew about his reputation, the parts that were from his public life, from his presidency. With his politics aside, however, there was another side of his life that this particular speech seemed to reflect. It reflects the character of someone who had struggled as a child with extreme asthma, and at some point in his teen, dedicated his life to what he termed a strenuous life. He took up several different sports and remained very active for the rest of his life. In addition to his medical issues, his personal life was not without tragedy. But the challenges he faced had a lot to do with who he became. The speech, Citizenship in a Republic, became known as the man in an arena. <clears throat> Excuse me. In it, he emphasized his belief that the success of a republic rested not on the brilliance of its citizens, but on the character of its people. He felt it important for leaders to demonstrate, not only through their words, but through their actions, qualities such as self-restraint, responsibility, and courage. Roosevelt believed that it's better to stumble while trying than to do nothing at all. He was definitely not a fan of cynics who chose to sit by and criticize those that are in the arena. The most famous part of the speech, the part I was so taken by, is this. The credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs and comes short again and again, because there is no effort without error and shortcoming but who does actually strive to do the deeds, who spends himself in a worthy cause, who at the very best knows in the end the triumph of high achievement, and who at the worst, if he fails, at least he fails while daring greatly, so that his place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who know neither victory nor defeat. There's a common thread that runs through the lectionary readings for this morning, that being the role of the prophet. When I read this speech by Roosevelt, all I could think about were the prophets. These are the people who dare greatly. A prophet is simply somebody called by God to speak for God to the people, sometimes to strengthen or encourage and other times to reprimand or to warn. Biblical prophets didn't normally have great qualifications for the job, and it was never seen as a reward for faithful service or hard work. Most of the persons God chose were the least likely in terms of strength or courage or oratory skills. In fact, most didn't even want the job. But as I heard someone say a few days ago, God doesn't make any mistakes. When God first approaches Ezekiel, he is so shocked and frightened, he falls out on the ground. God tells him to stand up. And once he does, God's voice gives him ruach, the breath or spirit of revelation. Thus beginning a unique dependence on the Holy Spirit, a relationship that prophets are known to have. Prophets depend on the Holy Spirit for guidance, revelation, inspiration, and insight. In order to understand Ezekiel's reaction, it might help to know what was going on at the time. Ezekiel was facing a huge challenge. 
His call takes place during one of the worst times in the history of Israel. So to set the scene, Ezekiel began his prophecies just four years after Nebuchadnezzar had led the Babylonian army into Jerusalem and defeated them. Ezekiel, along with a great deal of people from Judah, had been taken into captivity in Babylon. They'd been taken away from their families, their homes, their land, and most importantly, they'd been taken away from their temple. The Hebrew people believed that God dwelled in the temple. So if they had been taken away from the temple, they had been taken away from their God. And maybe their God wasn't as great as they thought their God was because seemingly their God had allowed them to be defeated. So maybe in retrospect, their God had been defeated as well. So you can just imagine where their faith was at this point. In retrospect, none of what happened to the people of Israel should have come as a surprise. They had rebelled against God for years, repeatedly ignoring warnings from other prophets. We can tell from what God says to Ezekiel, God knows this time is not going to be any different. More than once, God tells Ezekiel, do not be afraid. Don't be disappointed if they don't listen to you. What God emphasizes is Ezekiel's response. He must obey what God commands. Don't worry about whether you're successful. Don't worry, worry about whether you're popular. Do not judge yourself based on whether your audience repents or whether they even listen. God isn't even expecting them to listen. God describes them as a people with a hard forehead and a stubborn heart. However, God has made Ezekiel hard-headed by design. So he knows he's up to the challenge. And ultimately, God is prepared to take back the people of Israel and to forgive them and to love them as God has always loved them. Ezekiel's charge is primarily this. Stay focused on God. Stay focused on what God has commanded him to do. In other words, remain obedient and be prepared to dare not only greatly, but bravely. I read recently about a movement within evangelical branches of Christianity to revive the face of modern day prophecy. The author described contemporary prophecy as having been hijacked by temptations. Some prophets, as he described, had lost their humility and had become caught up in a type of prophecy that was more about maybe predicting the future, something that would bring them popularity and fame. They weren't listening to the Holy Spirit. Their prophecies weren't based on revelation as much as they were based on what they perceived would bring them fame. Their distraction had also led the people that listened to them to be distracted. The author believes that the primary role of prophetic Christian ministry is to point people to Christ. And he felt like that role had been lost. He also stated that every real prophetic word needs a reality check. He cited Y2K as an example. You guys remember that? We all thought the computers were going to crash. Remember, we stayed up all night that night ready to do something. He said he could remember when not only were the computers going to crash, but the prophets had said that it was going to leave the world without power, that we'd have no food sources, that we'd completely be lost because we'd have no technology. Their predictions caused a great deal of panic and preparation by people who believed their doom-filled messages. Others have predicted dates when the world was going to end. Fortunately, none of these predictions have come to pass. In the article, the author quotes Paul, who urges his followers to eagerly desire gifts of the Spirit, especially prophecy. But he warns them, do not treat prophecies with contempt, but test them. Paul goes on, goes on to say that on this side of heaven, 
we can only know in part. So we can only prophesy in part. Jesus understood the kind of rejection and hardships that Ezekiel experienced. He also knew we were going to be tempted by distractions, leading us to focus less on God and more on our own desires. Our desire to be accepted or to be considered insightful or wise. In Mark, when Jesus arrives in Nazareth, he was met with skepticism and hostility. As earlier in Jesus' ministry, those who reject Jesus' message do so because they lack faith. There's no place in their hearts to receive Jesus' message. We, like the Nazarenes, as well as the prophets, have to listen to our inner voice, our inner authority. This is where God's voice finds its home. The challenge for modern-day prophets, and truthfully for all of us, is to listen for the Holy Spirit in our lives and resist the distractions that seem to bombard us constantly from all sorts of places. All those things do nothing but take our focus away from God. Speaking truth to our world can be difficult. The hard reality is that like Ezekiel and Jesus, sometimes what we see and know in our hearts to be the truth is the very last thing those around us want to hear. We need to be prepared to fail, but only after daring greatly. And I will add bravely as well. Roosevelt's words continue to encourage a focus on character and to demonstrate not only through words, but through life choices, individual responsibility and courage both of which are required to make a difference in our world. Today, we celebrate the passage of the Declaration of Independence. We're actually celebrating the lives and labors of those who understood they had a responsibility to make a difference. They believed that there was a more equitable way that would allow opportunities for all. They fought hard to acquire the freedoms we have today. They took a lot of risks sometimes speaking their truth regardless of whether it was popular or not. The preamble to the Constitution states, in order to form a more perfect union, not a perfect union, but a more perfect union, one that we can continue to strive to make better. We as a nation, as a city, and as individuals will never be perfect. We're never going to reach that mark. But that doesn't mean that we can't always strive to be better. As the people of Israel traveled for generations through the wilderness, we as a country have been traveling through years of history. What happened to Israel is what happens to everyone who sets out on a journey. For some, it has felt like a barren desert and for others like an oasis of plenty. Until the end of time, we will continue to be challenged by prophets who ask us to listen. What God calls us to do and what Jesus calls us to do is to listen to our inner voice and to make choices based on what Jesus proclaims as truth. Sometimes the right choice is to shake off the dust from our feet choosing to separate ourselves from the distractions of our world that can separate us from what we know is the truth. To follow Christ requires us to live as though we are walking hand in hand with God, making choices where faith and hope are in partnership. Biblical prophets as well as contemporary prophets call us to make that leap of faith that allows us to see the past, the present, and the future, all beyond our expectations, beyond anything we can possibly imagine. They challenge us to spend ourselves in a worthy cause, which, much like the framers of our Constitution, was a challenge. They also challenge us to have faith in that which we cannot see but we know exists. At the best, knowing the triumph of high achievement, and at the worst, if we fail, 
at least we fail while daring greatly, ultimately to trust our daily journey to God. Amen.